Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Our Father, as we open the scriptures this morning, as we think about the times in which we live, I pray that thou wilt come into our hearts, guide us and teach us and comfort us this morning. In the name of Jesus, I ask these things. Amen. Do you feel in your heart of hearts that Jesus is coming soon? I know that many people do. We see the signs developing around the world. We see the signs in the religious world. Things are changing. Things are happening. It's as if the labor pains have begun. And those of you that are mothers know that when the labor pains begin, they don't stop. They keep going until the very final climax. And that's how it is today. We are living in the time of the end. And in the time of the end, the world's labor pains are taking place. The church's labor pains are taking place. And it will continue right until Jesus comes. And do those labor pains get easier as the birth comes nearer? No, they don't. They get more severe. They get sharper. They get stronger as the time goes on. And so it will be with the labor pains for God's people and the world. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves, and it's one that somebody challenged me with not so long ago, is what will be the mindset that will take us through? How shall we be able to cope? What preparation of our hearts and minds do we need to make? And so this morning, that's what I'm going to be looking at. There are many options we could think of. We could consider how deep is our loyalty to Christ. We could maybe wonder how unshakable we are in our experience with God. How much trust and faith do we have when we're praying? We may even consider our physical fitness and wonder whether our physical fitness will support our mind right until the end. But I want to show you that these are not enough. We have to go to the messenger of the Lord for these last days the messenger of the Lord who looked towards these labor pains that are coming upon us all, and she see what she says will see us through. Let me read a short quotation to you from Great Controversy, page 593. In order to stand the trial before them, they must understand and here follow four things. They must understand the will of God. The will of God as revealed in his word. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. Shall I read that again so that you can hear those concepts once more? In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character, government, and purposes, and act in accordance with them. And that really is the summary of my message this morning. Do you notice that it talks about the will of God as we find it in his word? Not the will of God as we think from impulse or we think from our spiritual imagination, but the solid will of God as found in his word. And then we find 
that we need to have a right conception of his government, his character, and his purposes, and having a right conception of his character, his government, and his purposes, we must act in accordance with them. And did you notice that she says that this is not for our salvation only, not for our ability to get through these hard times alone, but it is for the honor of God. In just those two or three lines of print that I have in front of me, there is a whole wealth of everything that Seventh-day Adventists hold dear. And that's what we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail. So when we think of those aspects that we've talked about, it will be those that will see us safely through to the end. Those will be the things that will see us through the labor pains that are coming into the world and into the church. And we have to find all our answers in Scripture. We have to be so sure that we and our experience is based on the Word of God. When Jesus was on this earth, he spoke. People saw the authority in his words. They knew that no man spake like this. We don't have Jesus here this morning. I think we wish we did. But yet, in a way, we do, because Jesus, the very same Jesus, is here in these words of Scripture. And this is where we can find that surety, that certainty, the help, the comfort, the guidance that we need for us to be able to get through. But do you remember that most important part that was mentioned? That we will give honor to him. So when you think of the future days, when you think of the time of Jacob's trouble, those seven last plagues that are coming upon the world, when you think of how we shall be derided and sneered at, when we think of those things, the main thing we must think of is, through it all, will we give honor to God or will we be concerned for our own lives and our own experience. If we are to be thrown into a cell, a prison cell for what we hold dear, should we be concerned for ourselves or should we be thinking, what will I do here that will bring glory to God? I remember hearing a story told by a very old Russian pastor some of you may know his name, Pastor Merkin. And Pastor Merkin was part of the underground Seventh-day Adventist movement in Russia. And he was thrown frequently into jail for what he believed. He would stay there a long time, and then he would be free to carry on preaching again, because he went straight out to preach again. And then he'd be thrown into prison again. And people who were in the same prison cell as he was time and again, felt that when he was thrown into the cell amongst these sacrilegious people, that an angel had come into their midst. They saw on his face something different. They saw in his demeanor something that reminded them of God. Because all these things are important for us to give honor to God. So now, when we think about it, those four aspects that we've talked about, we talked about the will of God, the character of God, the government of God, and the purposes of God, are really just four headings that tell us the different doctrines held by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So many people say, are doctrines enough? We, surely there's more to it than doctrine. In fact, why do we have to have doctrines at all? Surely it's enough if we love one another. 
but a doctrine is a teaching, pure and simply words of teaching. And so those words of teaching that God gives to his disciples about his will, his character, his government, and his purposes are what will keep us steady in the storms. That is what will keep us on, on course until we get through to the harbor. The doctrines are vitally important for us because if we start talking about loving God, loving one another, you can interpret it one way, I can interpret it another, but God may even interpret that love in a different way again. And therefore, there would be confusion. But if we, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, take the word of God as our guide, and the teachings of the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit and take that into our life, then we shall have teachings that will help us stand firm. I want to say to you that the doctrines are vitally important. Now, when we think about the will of God, let's look at that for a moment or two you can think that is so difficult. In my life, how can I know the will of God? This is a question that so many people ask. But first of all, the easiest way to come to conclusions is to look and see what is the will of God towards our world. Because when we start saying, how can we know the will of God for us? Do you see what we're doing? We're narrowing the will of God until it is just me and God. And yet, the world is full of the purposes of God. The will of God is so much wider than just me and God and me on my knees beside my bed. This is where we stop. But I believe that if we take our thinking much, much wider than that, Bible-wide, then we shall have a richer understanding of the will of God that will see us through to the end. Jesus, when he spoke, ever made things so simple that even the common people heard him gladly. The children went and sat on his knee and so, when Jesus came to this earth, he said in Luke 19, verse 10, <clears throat> he said in that verse, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. So when we're looking at the will of God, knowing and understanding the will of God, if we understand it as God understands it, then we shall have a right conception of God's plans. And his will is to seek and to save that which is lost. That might be you, but it might also be the community where you live. It might even be the mission fields around you. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were so frightened, they were so fearful that we know that they went and hid. They were hiding from God. I think that's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. But God did not leave them there. God went and found them. God went and he called to Adam and Eve, Adam, where art thou? When Jesus came to this world, he was calling, where art thou? 
So when we think of the will of God in our life, first and foremost, if we go to the world saying, where art thou, and give them the invitations of God, then we shall show them the will of God. And don't you think that by doing that, we then will know the will of God in our lives? Because as we reach out to this one and to that one, we shall find that our whole experience is richening and deepening in God. And we shall no longer ask, what is the will of God for my life? Because as we're thinking of seeking and saving the lost, we find that God is putting us where he wants us. He is guiding and directing us in our day's planning, in our future life, in the use of our funds. God is right there with us because we will be doing the will of God for us because we will be seeking and saving the lost. And if you are seeking, the saving, uh, seeking and saving the lost, what do you think the substance of your prayers will be when you have faces coming before you of people that you're giving Bible studies to, people that you're working with, people that you're writing emails to? Don't you have a very active prayer life as you bring those people one by one before the Lord? Are you not thinking of different ways in which you can show Jesus to them more fully? This is how following the will of God can strengthen us. Because as we are seeking and saving the lost, as we are bringing to them the teachings, the doctrines of God's word, you will find that you will have to know those doctrines for yourself. And you will have to be living them because the people out there in the world can tell so quickly whether you are just using words or whether it is something deep inside you. And if it's not inside you, they're very quick to say hypocrisy. All the churches are hypocrites. It is just words. And so as we seek and save the lost, we find that our prayer life deepens, our Bible knowledge deepens, our understanding of the doctrines deepens. So we begin to find that system of truth that the Bible is all the relevant parts of. And as we're talking to somebody, we see that that text in Revelation fits beautifully with that thought in the book of Daniel. Then we may go from the book of Daniel, we may go to the Old Testament prophets. We go to Revelation, we discover that it talks about the recreation of the earth. And we find that that's in Isaiah. And then we know more readily that it is in the book of Genesis. And when God talked about creation, he was talking about the power that's in his word and how mightily that power can recreate hearts. This is what God means by discovering the will of God. Doesn't that bring it into a much wider context than just saying, Lord, I don't know what you want in my life. So many things have happened to me. I can't understand the future. I don't know what you want of me. And just sinking into despair. So knowing the will of God is number one of those things that will give us the mindset to be able to go through those labor pains of the coming of the end of the world. When Jesus came to this world, did he know what the will of God was for him? He did. He knew clearly from the age of 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. He knew the will of God. And this is what was one of the things that saw him through 
experiences like Gethsemane because he knew, he said, not my will, but thine be done. That saw him through. So in the same way, our experience can mirror the experience of Christ. When Jesus came to this world, his will was to redeem sinners. Satan had kidnapped Adam, if you like. Satan had snatched this world to develop his own kingdom. And now Jesus had come to bring it back. He came to buy this world back with his own lifeblood because the penalty of sin was death. The death of an angel could not redeem this world. Even if Adam and Eve had died that day, still that world would not have been given back to God. That would not have worked. But God, in his providences, brought himself to earth. He was given to our world, and he died the death that should have been ours. He came to overcome the works of the evil one. So that is another part of what we are doing when we're discovering the will of God. We're looking at the works of the evil one, and we are working with the Lord to overcome the power of the evil one. This makes it such a glorious experience. We here, listening to this message, we are working with God to be able to overcome the devil. And sometimes the devil seems greater than God in our thinking. But with God, together, we can overcome the works of the devil. Jesus came to buy back people when he came to do the will of God. When he came back to buy back people, he came like people. He came a man like we are. He came in the same humanity as we are, with all its frailties, its temptations, its weaknesses, the same weakness that we have towards finding temptation attractive. Didn't Jesus have to say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan? When Peter said to him, surely the cross is not for you. Jesus, humanly, did not want to go to the cross. And so he had to say to Peter, get thee behind me, not Peter, but Satan. Jesus could see clearly, as we will, if we walk and work with Christ. When Jesus came to this world, he came to buy back the world, this little lost planet, with all its nature, with all its beauty that it had had. Jesus died on a tree. He died on a cross made of wood that had once upon a time been a living tree that he himself had given the life to. So when he died, he gave the possibility of this world being completely recreated. When Jesus died, what was Jesus wearing upon his head? He wore a crown of thorns. In the Garden of Eden, what was part of the curse that came upon the world? Was it not the thorns and the thistles? They were part of the curse of evil. Jesus took that curse to the cross and he wore those thorns on his sacred head so that we could go free. He wore those thorns on his head so that he could undo all the work and the power of the evil one. Jesus was not willing that any should perish. Not willing, not wishing. The will of God, the wishes 
of God. Doesn't that make it simpler to understand? This is what Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came to this world to show us, the wishes of God. This is why we can talk about a benevolent God, a God who wishes us well. This is God's plan for us. And he's saying, will you join me in that work? This is what I need you to do, not just to help other people, but to help, <clears throat> to help you go through the times that are coming. When we think about the next one, the character of God, having a right concept of the character of God, it's very important that we know and understand this because the devil has done his utmost to spoil the character of God in the eyes of the world. When something happens, the first question is, where was God when all that was happening? Why did God bring that on the world? People often say to me, I must be so wicked that God has brought this upon me as a punishment. I deserve that punishment. God is punishing me. And if you have that idea of God, you're not going to trust yourself to God. You're going to go through the world on tiptoes, looking up to heaven, thinking, if I do this, is that big stick going to come and land on my back? What a terrible picture of God when we've already discovered that he is the one that wishes us well. Who is the one that's brought all the difficulties into the world? Who was the one that made Adam and Eve feel afraid and guilty and blaming one another? Who was the one that brought murder into the world, brought lies into the world? The father of it all, Lucifer, who became known as Satan, the one that lost his position of light. He became darkness. And Satan, in that darkness, is dragging us all down. But the thing we must remember is that Satan always keeps himself hidden. So he may be the one that's standing before you but he takes a picture of God and places it between you and God. I've heard it called the hellish shadow, a darkness from hell. And he brings that between you and God so you cannot see the true God who stands in front of you with love in his face, his hands outstretched, with the nail prints in his hands. People forget that when they're saying, where was God when all this happened? Why does God allow these things? God himself has suffered at the hands of Satan. Yes, we may think that knowing the character of God is too big for us. That's something that our finite minds cannot comprehend. But fortunately, the Gospels give us a picture of Christ, of God on earth. I think of Jesus with the children on his knee. Do children trust anybody? No, they don't. Sometimes if you ask a child to come on your knee, sometimes that child won't come because the child knows whether you're a person that it loves and trusts or not. Jesus took those children on his knee and they didn't wriggle and squirm to get away and run back to mum. They knew that Jesus was someone who loved them and cared for them. But then I want you to think about Martha. Martha, the hot, sticky Martha in the kitchen with her hands all dirty on her apron from the food and nobody helping her carry the dishes in for these 13 hungry men that had come for a meal. 
Jesus knew Martha's situation. Martha came through and said, Lord, send my sister into the kitchen. I need help now. Humanly, yes, she did. Did Jesus get cross with her? No, he didn't. Very quietly and gently, he said, Martha, Martha, you're troubled and concerned about many things. And he showed her the right perspective. Jesus knows, he still knows, ordinary people's lives and situations. You can trust yourself to the character of God. Jesus, when he went to heaven, took those wounded hands with him. He's now standing at the Father's throne, which is why we are invited to come boldly to ask for mercy if we need it, because we do fall. He invites us to come so that we can have help when we need it. Lord, help me. Lord, save me. I'm in temptation. I need your help now. And will he put us on probation and make us wait? No, because the Lord says that his help is here for us. It is immediate if we believe. The character of God is so great. We see his patience and his compassion. We see his love and his goodness. Jesus described himself as the good shepherd. And the good shepherds in Palestine did not drive their sheep. They didn't force their sheep to follow him. Not like the devil does. The devil works by force. Jesus says, follow me. Know my voice, know my character, know the way I work, and then trust me. And will he let you down? You may go through the valley of the shadow of death. You may wonder what experiences are to come. But he says, yea, I am with thee always. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow thee all the days of my life. That is what God says to us. And I want to read you a verse from Acts chapter 10, verse 38. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And there it's talking about Jesus, and it describes him as a Savior who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Do you see these things in the character of God in these verses? Jesus showing us the character of God. He went about doing good. The spirit of prophecy tells us that we should crowd each day with as many little acts of goodness as we can. If you're thinking goodness towards people, do you think your life will change? It will change, and you will start to reflect the character of Christ. But the second part said that he healed all who were oppressed of the devil. So when we are under the devil's spell, when we feel oppressed and burdened, Jesus, when he was on earth, took that burden from people's hearts and minds. We must go about relieving people of the works of the devil. How do we do it? By exorcisms? No. The chief way of doing it is to reach into somebody's heart, show them their sins that come from the evil one, and show them the ways of God to put in their lives in place of that and show them how much God loves them, how much he wishes them well. And doing that, we shall be able to save many people for the Lord. <clears throat> but we can also know the character of God by personal experience, and this is also a deep one, because we know that during the time of Jacob's trouble, during the time of the plagues, we may be alone. When we have to stand before courts, we may have to be alone. 
But the character of God is such that he will be with us at all times. We know that he is forgiving. We don't feel worthy of God's love sometimes. We can think back over our lives and even as senior people, we can still blush for what we did when we were younger. Those follies of youth, Solomon knew about those, but God knows. We don't have to keep thinking of those things that we've done, those things that we feel so ashamed of now. God has taken them. He has thrown them to the bottom of the sea. Why do we have to go and get them back? We don't. It's the devil that brings that oppression to us. God takes all that away, and we have to show Jesus to people, lifted up on a cross, drawing all people to him, because this is what he said he will do. When we explain to Jesus, to explain to people about the pardon that Jesus gives, and the forgiveness that he gives, and the new life that he gives, we can bring joy into people's lives to take the place of the oppression of the evil one. Just think for just a minute how many doctrines we've talked about so far. We've talked about many of them without realizing it. We've talked about God himself. We've talked about God the Father. We've talked about God the Son, Jesus Christ. We've talked about the Holy Spirit. We've talked about his incarnation. We've talked about faith and obedience and righteousness by faith. We've talked about the place of the scriptures. We've talked about creation. We've talked about becoming perfect with God so that we can reflect him to the world and show his glory to the world. When we are preaching the simple gospel to the most simple mind, we are showing and teaching and opening up to people the very doctrines that the Seventh-day Adventist Church holds. That couldn't be simpler, could it? And this is what God wants us to do when we're witnessing to people. Let's think about the government of God. I want you to go to Revelation 15 and verse 3 to read a verse there. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 3. This is going forward in time until all those troubles are over that we're talking about. And it says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Sometimes we look back in time to see how God is unchanging. For this portion of my message, I want us to go forward in time to when God has made all things new, when the judgment is complete and all is well. Because here we find that God is just and true in thy ways, thou king of saints. So when we talk about the government of God, a government has laws. A government has a throne. A government has a kingdom. A government has citizens. So we need to know and understand if we're going to get through the hard times ahead, the times when we are opposed and derided, the times when the trials before us, we need to understand the government of God. Because again, Satan has interposed his government, which is rules and force and bad attitudes towards people, cruelty. And we need to look at how God governs the world. And in these verses it says, just and true are the works of God. 
God is fair. God is open. He's honest. And as we'd say today, God is transparent in all his dealings, which is why he has a judgment for all people. At the present time, there is a judgment going on in heaven that we call the investigative judgment, and that is where the angels have brought the books and opened them before the judge. That is where they can see those that are fit to be called the citizens of this new kingdom that God wants to make, because he's drawing up his citizenship list now. And do you think your guardian angel knows you very well? Your guardian angel knows everything about you, has watched you from when you were this high. And your guardian angel could say to the Savior, who's also your judge, remember, your guardian angel could say, I know that person. They're probably not really to be trusted in heaven. And the books would be opened. There would be your name in the book. There would be all the deeds of your life. And the times when you've not been consistent for God. You've made a good public profession. And don't we all? But what happens inside of us when we're on our own? Are we transparent for God then? And these are the things that they're looking at in those books. And for those names that are in the books, when the records have pardon across everything and they see that that person is fully on the side of God, then that record book can be blotted out of all its sins and closed forever. Those sins are gone for always. What a wonderful thought that will be. But God is fair and just. He is giving us every opportunity now for what we will do with what's in the books. And this is part of what we need to tell other people. Doesn't the first angel's message say the judgment of God is come? His judgment is come? This is the message we must tell the people. People don't understand about the judgment of God. But if we understand what's happening, we will be better able to stand in those last days. And when you have a judgment, and when Christ is building up the citizenship, at the end of the judgment, he will receive a kingdom do you remember those words in Daniel chapter 7? Let's just look at them. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And there it says, And there was given him a dominion and glory and a kingdom given to Christ our Savior who brought us back from the evil one that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. But it doesn't stop there. If you go further down the chapter to verse 27, you will find that we have been co-laborers with God in this world, and now we will be joint heirs of this kingdom. The Savior will share it with us, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the purpose of God in his judgments and in his kingdom and the way he rules and governs the earth. Our little speck is the only one that is not synchronized with the rest of the universes. And God is wanting to bring us back into harmony with every other universe. 
But how does that make you feel? This is a speck of a world. We think Satan is huge sometimes. Satan is only a speck in this world. His angels are only specks in this world. But the God of heaven came to die on the cross in this same world to give us the chance to share that kingdom with him. He wants us to share in the government, to be kings and priests to God. What a wonderful experience that will be. This world is a world that's on probation. We're living in a time of probation. And there are quite a number of doctrines involved with this time. We discover that we're talking here about the end of all evil. We're talking about the, the judgment. We're talking about sin being the transgression of the law of the kingdom. That's why it cannot be any other definition for sin. People come up with other definitions. But it is the transgression of the law because we are talking about the government of God and the kingdom of God in this world. So can you see that as we understand these things, we are going to have a much, much firmer foundation on which to say, no, that is not the truth, because the Bible says, the word of God tells me. And then we find, when we're talking about the government of God and his law and his commandments, we find the Sabbath at the heart of it. The Sabbath that was given to man as a gift, God's benevolence, how God has actually done that as a blessing for us. The Sabbath is not bondage. The Sabbath is not a hard experience. It's a very real blessing. And this is, if you like, a doctrine connected with the government of God. He tells us to fear him. And we know that to fear God is to keep his commandments, to be a good citizen of his world. We're learning here to be a good citizen of the new world to come. And here we also find the three angels' messages because they are talking about worshiping God, talking about the judgment, talking about the creator, because that is his identification within the Sabbath commandment, also telling us that Babylon has fallen. Satan and his realms have fallen. Not are about to fall, but the message we give is that Babylon has fallen. And when we come to Revelation 18, it's repeated loudly with a strong voice, with great light and glory flooding the world as we do the will of God and tell others about it. There is confusion, but it's not of God. There is force and cruelty in religion, but it's not of God. Babylon has fallen. Look at my God. And by our life and demeanor, we should be able to say that so strongly. Look at what my God has done for me. Doesn't it say in Revelation that we are saved by his blood, but by the testimony of our mouths, by the words of our mouths? This is the message that I'm giving today. This is how it all works together. And we know that at the very heart of the commandments, God has put his identification. He has also put another commandment, number 10, thou shalt not covet. Coveting is a very selfish thing. It's something that nobody else can see. I wouldn't know whether anybody around me is coveting something. But they may be, but God can see. And the Holy Spirit will point into your life and he will say, I can see that you are breaking one of my Ten Commandments. If you have broken one, you have broken the whole law. So God points us to his ID as creator at the end of the first four. 
and he points to our hearts, our minds, and our motives in the last one of the last six, thou shalt not covet. Everything that is a doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church fits a pattern and fits without contradiction. It is there. And so, what is God's overarching purpose for himself, for us in this world, for the Bible that we have? His overarching purpose is to remove sin from his world, to destroy the purposes of the devil. And that means that he has to destroy sin in your life. Do you want him to destroy the sin in your life? Or are you quite happy to go through the day doing a little bit of good, but a few words that are a bit unkind, and having to kneel by your bed at night and say, Lord, I've done it again, I am sorry. Are you happy to go on like that day after day? Is it a satisfying way of living? It's not. It can bring you down to the point where you feel worthless. And very often, people who feel worthless do not want to take part in the communion of the Lord, which is another doctrine that we hold. God does not want us to feel worthless. He wants us to realize how valuable we are to him. He wants us to know his power. He wants us to get to the point where we stop sinning and instead we're looking to say, Lord, show me what good I can do. Show me much more how I can love. Show me how much more work I can do for you. And when the devil comes to us, that Jesus will be able to say, along as he did himself, that the devil has nothing in us. You may think that's a very, very high doctrine, a high standard, but it will have to come to that last generation because Jesus said, they that are holy, let them be holy still. They that are righteous, let them be righteous still. Could God let us through the gates into the tree to the tree of life if we still had a little bit of sin inside us? We have to learn to use the strongest two words in the language. Yes to God, always yes to God, but an equally strong no to the devil. But did you notice which order I put those in? It's yes to God, yes to God all the time. No to Satan with equal firmness, but looking to Jesus. Because it's only in looking to Jesus that we experience the power that he has. Our Savior's purpose is to bring us to be like Jesus. I know we use words like moral perfection, perfection of character, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And it frightens us. But if I say to you, be like Jesus, be like Jesus, this my song. In the home or in the throng we used to sing. Be like Jesus all day long. I can understand that. I can cope with that. But can you see how important it is for us to see all the doctrines that we have? Prophecy tells us that God will be triumphant. God will win this conflict of good and evil. But do you know the wonderful thing is that God is doing great things in this world? There are many people in this world <coughs> who are getting near the point of committing the unpardonable sin. <coughs> Excuse me. There are many people in this world who are getting near the point of committing the unpardonable sin. And that means they have said, no, no, 
no to God time and again till finally now they're not hardly hearing the voice of God. One day they will have put the last brick in the wall between themselves and God and they will have said to God, no. But before this happens, we're told that God will send flashes of light to alert those people, to awaken them from the slumbers they've come into. If you've been in this position of saying no to God for a long time, there may be just one flash of light that will come to you. Heed that light and follow the words of God to find the salvation he wants to bring to you. Jesus is still in the most holy place of the sanctuary. He is still pleading in heaven for you. He's still interceding for you and saying, Father, I love these children. I died for them. Father, my blood, my blood, not yet. Hold a little longer before everything closes. That is what our Savior is doing for us in heaven. It was the blood that he shed on the cross that is so powerful for us. But yet, we may still be saying, no, Lord, not yet. One day, Jesus will come out of the most holy place of the sanctuary. He will take off those priestly robes. And the Bible tells us he will put on his garments of vengeance. Does that sound like the kind of God that you want to serve? Many people would think, no, I don't like the idea of a God of vengeance. <clears throat> But didn't the verses in Revelation that we read talk about a God who is just in all his ways? Justice means law and justice. It means love and punishment. We have to keep those completely in balance in our understanding of God. If we believe that God is only love, we shall be completely led astray the devil will take us into error. If we believe that God is harsh, then the devil has got us there. But we must believe that God can punish, and he can punish because he took the penalty. He himself died for his own law. He has empowered himself, if you like, to be able to take the action that's needed. But at the same time, he loves people. The two are held in tension which is correct and accurate. <clears throat> These are the doctrines that we hold. So I'm asking now, what is the mindset which will see people through those last days? I hope it's clearer in your mind now. I'm going to read that quotation again, and I think it'll make a lot more sense to you now. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in his word. They can honor him only as they have a right conception of his character his government and his purposes, and act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truth of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. None but those who have fortified their mind with the truth of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Not Wikipedia, not the internet, not DVDs. If you have fortified your mind with the Bible, too many people today are listening and watching people, but they're not seeing God. I want you to see God in his word so that you will be able to stand. <clears throat> I want to show you something this morning. Here I have a person a generic person. And if I was to show you that person, you couldn't tell if that person was good or bad. 
that person could go through the whole of his Christian life giving a very good impression. And that person could come to the end and fall. And you would think, I never thought that would happen to that person. And do you know why that person fell like that? Because that person did not have the right experience inside. I can open these two little doors with their little handles and I can look inside. I can look into the mind of this person and in the mind of that person, I see that he or she has the mind of Christ. Out of sight, hidden, but you will stand with that. But behind the other door, it says something else. It said, the character of Christ. I won't recap the whole message, but you know now what is the character of Christ. So we need the mind of Christ in our minds. We need the character of Christ hidden deep inside our hearts. That person will stand. That person could fall. Which decision will you make this morning? We don't know how long these labor pains are going to continue. The kingdom of God, <clears throat> the kingdom of God will come to birth. The kingdom of God will be a reality. And I would like to think that everybody hearing these words and watching this presentation will make the decision to come to Jesus now before it is too late. Take courage. Live the kind of life that Christ wants you to do openly, honestly, and transparently before heaven. Will you bow your heads with me? Our Father, we thank thee that the scriptures are so full of treasures. And we know that by faith, we can reach into that word and take those treasures to make them our own. Sometimes we call them doctrines, but we know it is only an explanation or a teaching, a teaching about Jesus. We need to know what they are so that we can have the mind of Jesus and we can have the character of Jesus. So my prayer is this morning that we may stand firm and have thee firmly in our hearts and minds today that others may know that almost an angel has been in their midst as we have walked through the world. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.